Okay, um, so the next session is about the oceans. Um, why are we talking about the oceans? Um, the oceans cover about 71% of the Earth's surface, and we basically don't really know what is going on out there. It's, it's pretty much a data dead zone, um, which considering that 90% of global trade travels over the oceans, um, that's not very good. So this is not really just about the environment and the climate, but it's really about trade, um, global economy, human rights, national security. Um, so I've got a great panel who is going to come up any moment now um, to talk about this. Hello, take your seats, please. And then we're going to get going. So this is really um, in sort of Silicon Valley in tech parlance. It's really an area that is ripe for disruption and when we consider how important the oceans are to to pretty much everything that we do. So um, we're switching from urban environments to water now. So we're gonna be starting um, up in space with Peter Platzer, who's the CEO of Spire. And Peter is the guy who introduced me to Cube Satellites. So tell us a little bit about what Spire is doing. And I also think it'd be useful to um, talk a little bit how what you're doing is different to or complements what Will does, because some folks heard from him earlier today. Right, yes, right. So uh, uh, thanks for having me, Simone. You know, I love being here. So I really appreciate that. Um, a CubeSat is a, uh, an entirely different way of leveraging space for life on Earth. Um, a CubeSat is, you know, a little bit bigger than this, um, this bottle. Um, it is now the most uh, widely used uh, satellite form factor. There are more CubeSats launched than any other type of satellites. And if you think about the type of satellites, right, there are three types of satellites. There are looking satellites, there are listening satellites, and there are talking satellites. Looking satellites is, of course, what Will does um, in an exemplary way and fantastic. They, uh, they image the Earth. Uh, then we have uh, talking satellites, which uh, things like SpaceX or OneWeb do that uh, do communication. And then you have listening satellites, which is what Spire does, uh, where we use radio frequencies and antenna to pick up signals all over the Earth. In particular, we focus on signals where the only way to gather the data necessary is through a large number of satellites. Because if size doesn't matter but number matters, that's like the niche of those type of satellites. Right, and, and one of the key things to, to point out here, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that Currently, you can cover every spot on the Earth about, I think you said, 15 to 30 minutes. And when we're talking about the oceans, that is a huge improvement on what has been the norm in the past, which I believe is every six to eight hours. Yeah, okay. you're completely correct. Right. Yeah, okay. I think that's like the, uh, um, the order of magnitude improvement that we're talking about here is uh, not just knowing where something is every you know, um, six or eight hours or three or four times a day, but knowing it, you know, three or four times an hour, 10 times, 20 times an hour. Got it, right. So we're gonna move from um, space to, to the surface. So Anthony, do you wanna tell folks a little bit about Nautilus Labs and what yeah. you guys are doing? Sure, so uh, Nautilus Labs is taking uh, cloud analytics, big data analytics, uh, and trying to bring that to the shipping industry to really uh, reduce the amount of fuel that they use on a daily basis. Um, and these numbers that we're talking about uh, are, are kind of astronomical. Uh, it's, a, it's a space where they burn some of the dirtiest fuel we have. It's called bunker fuel. Um, for those of you that don't know what it is, it is the shit of the shit. It is the last part of the oil refinery process that uh, they didn't know what to do with. Uh, and it just so happens that shipping was the perfect vehicle to burn that. Um, and it's been done that way for a very, very long time. Uh, and uh, we can use data and analysis, uh, a lot of the technologies that we've talked about today, to help reduce up to anywhere up to 30% on their fuel usage uh, on their voyages. And talk a little bit, I mean, you know, this is a room of people who talk about data pretty much all the time. Um, explain why this is important when it comes to what's happening out in the oceans, because my understanding is there's very little data. Yes. So all of these ships right now are generating uh, anywhere between 5 and 10 gigabytes a day. Um, 
re, you know, within three years ago was the first time they actually had access to internet. Um, and even now, the, the speeds that we're talking about are in the 250 kilobits of second um, upload time. So just to give you an idea of how, uh, how kind of new this is, um, and this is why we think what we're doing is very pioneering, and we're actually, uh, you, you don't have to put in a completely new system to gain access to all of that data, which is uh, what a lot of the big marine electronics players are trying to do right now. They're telling you, you know, we got to swap everything out, we got to put in a new system. Um, and what's even more interesting is that uh, all of these systems that they're putting in right now uh, were not designed to be connected because they were designed three, four, five, six years ago in these long uh, design cycle times. So what we've done is uh, built an entire system from the ground up, hardware, software, uh, to help collect this data in a secure way. Um, and so, so it, it's, it's about data management, fleet reporting, um, in a way that just has not happened before. Yeah, it, it's a true meld of two different worlds, right? Okay. Tech and, and shipping. Right, right. And your goal is to sort of reduce operational costs, that helps the environment, that changes the industry, yes. all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to go to, to John. John, um, I was listening, he was talking to Gary before, he says, once in a while, you like to stir the pot a little bit. So John <laughs> is now a maritime <laughs> security expert with his new company. I'm so reincarnated. Reincarnated, that's right. So you've talked to me a lot about sort of the um, maritime IoT space, and basically your goal is to give us vision into something nobody can actually see right now. So um, thanks, Simone. I am the chairman of the board of Thayer Mahan, which is a one-year-old company that was co-founded by the former commander of the U.S. Navy's undersea force. And so the company's mission is basically to cover everything from the surface of the ocean on down, which at present cannot be visualized by satellite uh, imagery. And if you think about what goes on under the ocean, we have more and more undersea mining, we have submarines, we have fisheries, we have the condition of the oceans in terms of its chemical composition. We have really an unknown, non-existent map of sea states, underwater currents, which are analogous to the jet stream and things that float around in the air, but which we don't uh, know much about in terms of the oceans, it, not, either in terms of mapping them fundamentally or in terms of uh, tracking changes as population density grows, et cetera. We have geopolitical issues in terms of uh, things like the Spratly Islands, where if you look at the map and you take a look at where China is building these bases, and then you draw a 200-mile radius around those islands, it covers basically the carotid artery of a big chunk of Asian commercial shipping. Um, so Thayer Mahan is basically a um, systems integration play that links uh, autonomous vehicles, a wide variety of sensors, because the container can be about um, chemical, uh, radiation, uh, acoustic, electronic, or whatever. Um, and uh, based on some novel uh, technology that vastly amplifies the power of this uh, either individual or fleet of intelligent sensors that can navigate, that can go to where they're needed, that can uh, be sensitive to certain kinds of anomalies, that can report back. We kind of look at it as uh, ADT for the ocean in, in some respects. Um, Thayer Mahan uh, is an homage to Albert Thayer Mahan, who was the great uh, naval strategist of the right at the turn of the 20th century, who basically defined the dreadnought era. You know, he ba everything he said is now obsolete, but his, his work was so influential that, for example, every ship in the Japanese Navy at the turn of the century was required to have a translated uh, copy of his manifesto in the stateroom of the captain. So we are in an equally profound transition now from the dreadnought era, which is really the mainframe era, centralized command and control, large, inflexible, expensive assets to small, agile, swarm networked assets. Uh, and that's uh, very much at the heart of the uh, uh, Thayer Mahan uh, strategy. Got it. Um, Rob, from a small startup called BAE Systems. Yeah. Um, so BAE Systems, obviously, a big system integrator, technology company focused on defense technology. Um, we work the gambit from space all the way to undersea. Um, big focus we have in this space is you'll see that the defense world nowadays uh, has really been focused on 
I would say has not been focused on the shipping and the, the sea due to the fact of big, big expensive satellites can't really afford the technology where they're now with the shift to Pacific, they're really looking at commercial technology. So we're really kind of focused on being a data broker for companies such as Spire or Nautilus Labs to help bring that technology into the U.S. government. So it, so it sounds like, and we were talking about this at, at dinner a little bit, the dinner you were not at, um, and we were saying that um, it seems like over the past few years, the game changer in this, certainly on the above surface stuff, is actually satellites and CubeSats. Is that correct? It is. Right. Um, you'd say, again, refresh rates for the big government satellites, they, it was in days, decades ago, right? It's now becoming to the where, where with CubeSats, you can get refresh rates of almost minutes as more, more and more of these constellations go up. So because that's changing, it's allowing us to be able to do more change detection, more tracking, and help that government be able to see all that stuff on the ground. And I think it's important for everyone to sort of realize, if, if they didn't, um, that up until relatively recently, you'd sort of let one of these gigantic ship container ships or tankers or whatever they are kind of float out from port and then it would sort of go along its merry little way and you've got the guy at the other end literally just standing there waiting to see it like there really was or is very um it's very difficult to find these gigantic um things that also happen to disappear occasionally as well and when you think about sort of what's on them when you think about the logistics um it, that's kind of amazing. So what, what, what these guys are doing is really sort of starting to give us um, visibility into something that we've never really oddly paid attention to before. So um, I'm curious though, so we've got three startups um, and then we've got BAE. So you guys must all sort of be working together somehow, right? Because you get the data, you want the data, you've got data. You're protecting us under. You're, you've actually got less data. No, no. Actually, well, I didn't go, go into gory details about yeah. that, but um, there are a lot of players out there who collect data routinely, but they're siloed. If we refer back to some of the discussion about government uh, use of data and so on, mm -hmm. uh, so Thayer Mahan is actually an integrator of data sets, and we are employing uh, the usual data science, deep mm -hmm. learning. Uh, um, machinery to analyzing the data and also uh, analyzing it prospectively. So there is a, we, we have indigenous data because our uh, 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 vehicles, our sensor networks actually will generate an enormous amount of data, mm -hmm. but we also have relationships with people that own data that want us to use it. I, I, sorry, I, I think the point that you're making that a, all of us are working together and um, uncovering a vast amount of information that it's hard to imagine that in the 21st century we don't know, right? For me, it was shocking to realize that um, piracy, for example, is, is something not from, uh, from funny movies, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but it's something that is happening today, right? In Singapore, one of the largest ports, they literally hold oil tankers are being stolen. And it's a, it's a problem of, the, of about $10 billion a year um, in the 21st century because we can't find ships. Right. Can, can I build on that? Because yeah. I think the, the oceans are kind of a global commons where there is almost no regulation. There are uh, sort of weak agreements like the uh, International uh, Law of the Sea Accords for the UN, which by the way, the US is not a signatory to. Mm -hmm. There are very interesting examples of uh, nation uh, to nation cooperation around search and rescue right. and combating piracy, but there's no overarching framework for uh, understanding what maritime security really is all about and also how to m best deploy the data in a way that benefits global civil society. Right. So I know building on that a little more, I mean, we look at piracy as one example, but uh, think about all the international maritime laws and then start to think about who actually regulates that. Right. Nobody. There, the, yeah. there is, Nobody. Is, it, is it US? <laughs> is it Canada? Is it, you know, it's like, yeah. You're, it's, a, it's a call between presidents and you have to, you know, it, it's actually a total mess. Um, and so when we look at, especially now, the IMO has just passed a whole bunch of, of thankfully, um, uh, the IMO is the International Maritime Organization, which basically dictates all, all uh, international maritime law. And they just, thankfully, reduced the sulfur cap in fuels in ships from 3.5% to 0.5% in 2020. Mm -hmm 
which is a great environmental move. I don't know how it's going to affect their businesses because it's a disaster there as well. But um, again, there's no regulation. Uh, no one to enforce these laws. Right. Well, it's very just. <laughs> That won't uh, change fragmented it as well from like each government actually looks at their own thing. So we've actually been selling our GXP product, which integrates some of the technologies such as Peter's and uh, and Anthony's. And you have to go to each government and actually sell that technology to them to help them track their maritime assets. And it's getting worse because of the zero sum nature of the maritime environment. You know, the Chinese Navy is becoming more, you know, kind of blue ocean. The Russian Navy is sending a lot of ships out to, you know, show the flag, so to speak. Right. Um, and so the notion that there would be global cooperation is, is slim to none. Slim. Some, yeah. Right. And we, we were talking about this um, on the phone as well. I mean, I think um, both of you guys were talking about the sea sort of as the new frontier. So in terms of defense and the military, they're paying, it's not that they're paying less attention to Afghanistan or Iraq, but they are starting to focus a lot more on what is happening in, they're in the They're shifting to the Pacific. Yeah. Yes. So that's the pivot to the Pacific. That's so, and that involves or that is, has impact on what all of you guys do. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I really like the, the word that, um, uh, that you used, uh, John, of uh, carotid artery, right? It's, uh, you said it in the intro, 90% of global trade happens on ship, and 80% of the time, uh, we don't know where they are, right? There is yeah. this, this huge um, 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 uh, global tumultuous area in the South China Sea uh, which is just uh, waiting to to explode in some shape or form, and and I think stuff that you know all of us are doing uh, is providing more transparency and more data, um, because it's really really hard to talk about things if the data is not available. Right. So you know, give, given that, that that's happening, and about I think 80% of internet traffic flows actually un, in those underwater undersea cables, yeah. um, and then if you think about safety of ports, which are sort of the lifeline of countries, how do we protect it? I mean, we've talked about cybersecurity a lot here. What are the chances of someone just kind of, you know, taking a machine and cutting a cord? Isn't that more disruptive? Well, right now, um, Russia can do that anytime they want. And there's right. a bundle of cables about 100 miles to the west of uh, Ireland, which um, they've been inspecting with undersea vehicles. And, so, and there is no monitoring, just as there's no monitoring of harbors, uh, oil and gas extraction infrastructure, et cetera. So is it easier to monitor from space and satellites and what's going on on the surface than it would be to monitor anything below the surface? Yeah, so, yeah. Yes. So you, yeah. we cannot do anything um, uh, below the surface. Right. Um, for that one, we have to rely on uh, on people that can integrate um, technologies uh, from uh, from below the ocean. We have enough trouble just navigating underneath the <laughs> underneath the ocean, let yeah. alone right. tracking under it. Well, that's that's ocean, what right? you told me, well. which I thought was quite surprising. You, I think you said that. Um, it's actually very difficult to know where submarines are, and not just because you don't want people to know where they are, but you actually don't know where they are. Well, well, I mean, obviously, one of the programs we're working on right now with DARPA is to set up a GPS network underneath the ocean because there is no way to track it at, mo at the moment. And so an acoustic GPS system may be the solution. Still, okay. um, We are going to go to questions right? soon, yeah. so if you have them, um, put your hands up and look for a mic. Oh. We've got one right there. Okay. Um, Tim Carone from Notre Dame. I don't know if anybody's here from Planet Labs, but they talked about imaging a three meter resolution every point on the globe. I, so I'm wondering how does that help you or not help you? It With, helps quite a bit. Obviously, you can yeah. do uh, change detection. Right, from change that. detection. These ships don't move very fast. Correct. My nephew almost um, grounded his. Uh, his tanker into Cuba because he made a navigation mistake, but yes. it took him yeah. a couple hours to, to correct it. Um, I, have you started using those sort of data sets at all? We have. Uh, um, we actually import their data today. Um, one of the things you see right now with the shift to Pacific was the government used to be very focused on it has to be our own satellite and it has to be down to this granularity. Well, they're realizing that, especially in the ocean, you don't need to get down to that fine level. Three meters is good enough. So now they're starting, you'll see that the government is now starting to reach out to that technology, trying to pull that in. And so companies like BAE Systems, trying to be system integrator and data brokers, is helping bring that technology into the government. 
And what we are doing is, uh, is, is working with, uh, with Will and Robbie and, and their team to combine the identification information that comes from our satellite, which tells you what is the name of the ship, where it's coming, where it's heading, what's the GPS, um, and uh, create training data sets um, uh, for machine learning algorithms that, that can sift through the gigabytes of data that uh, that Planet is producing and not just have there is a ship um, uh, in some kind of dots, but being able to say based on a learning data set, this exactly is the ship. Um, the, the, the difficulty still is, um, as you recall from Will's talk, their goal is to map all of the world once per day. What we need for is for things like piracy, for illegal fishing, um, for, for maritime insurance purposes, is map all of the ship, uh, not once a day, but you know, once every 10 minutes. Um, so it really is the combination of both data sets um, uh, that is necessary to bring about an entirely new level of transparency of the oceans, which is, as you said, the much, much larger portion of the world. For example, the economic zone on the oceans of the United States is about almost twice as large as the landmass of the United States. Even though we experience only our country, our country, our landmass is only the third of our land, of our property, of our economic interest. The other two thirds are on the ocean and they're incredibly difficult to monitor and, and, uh, and keep safe right now. I'll, I'll comment on that further. Uh, in the shipping business, it's all about risk management. Every decision they make is a reducing risk. If yes, great. If no, let's talk, is you better be saving a lot of money. Um, and those are the two decisions, right? those are the only two factors that actually play into that. So the more data that we can provide, not just companies, but insurance companies, um, all of this is obviously an atomizer, right? We don't, we don't tell anyone uh, any of this. And, and frankly, right now, uh, Nautilus is not selling any data to anyone. Um, uh, that we keep within our bounds, and that's very important to to gaining uh, uh, trust of these companies. Right? This is this is very privy information that we're uh, we're talking about here, and they can influence uh, shipping rates and have drastic effects on economies if you could get your hands on it. Right? So so we've gone through and made sure that uh, we've taken the proper precautions that make sure your data is safe. Um, so the more data, though, is always better. Right? <laughs> But you need automation with that to be able to sort out the data that you don't need, especially Absolutely. in the ocean when you're looking at Absolutely. blue ocean with nothing in it. It's so we, we really ingest mm -hmm. that data um, and then actually do tracking on it as well. So yep. it, the problem you've seen with the sea, though, is there just has not been enough data. Now that you're starting to get Planet Lab, you're starting to get Spire up there, we're starting to see enough data where we can actually do the tracking on it and be able to keep track of where the ships are at. So at some point we're going to drown in the data just like we do up here as well and not know what to do with it? Correct. Okay. Unless you do automation, you know, clear out the data that okay, you don't need. Okay, good. It's right here. Um, hi, I'm Mark Rotenberg. I'm a privacy advocate, but I'm also a sailor. And I was really interested to follow the deployment of AIS, which is a very useful technology for identifying vessels at sea and for avoiding collision. Um, in the old days, we might rely on radar to see something hard that we didn't want to hit. Now we have data points that show us the identification of a ship and its track and its you know, mean time to collision and so forth. Um, but then I was interested to learn that those tracks are being uh, recorded uh, by the Coast Guard and transferred to the Department of Homeland Security. And from the point of view of a recreational boater as opposed to a commercial shipping line, that actually really surprised me because what the boater experiences is the desire to avoid the collision. They look down on the chart plotter, they avoid the ship, and you know that's the end of it. But apparently it's not the end of it for the Department of Homeland Security because they keep all the tracks now on all the recreational boats in the United States. And this led us to bring a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit against the DHS because we actually thought it was unnecessary and excessive. And I guess my question for you is, are there some lines we need to draw uh, in data collection? 
Uh, I could easily see something similar being done a few years from now with GPS and cars, for example, and the government could simply keep the tracks of all locations of all automobiles in the United States. Uh, do you think that's excessive? Do you think it's reasonable? What are, what are your views? I, I think we do need to get that to that level. Um, I mean, just in general, right? Google Earth can, can take images of our, fo of our homes. So I think there's going to be a point where we have to get to those laws and, and figure out what it is. I think there's been con conversations about it already, but I don't think anyone's got the answer for it yet. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to on-ship, we are not giving that data to anyone. Uh, we, we keep everything that we collect, we keep internally. If anyone in this room right now could go buy a subscription to a uh, satellite AIS system and see any ship and see who owns it, what's in it, where it's going, what port it came from, it's heading at any time. I mean, this is all, you, anyone could do this in this room right now. Um, so I think it's an interesting point, especially when you come, on one hand, we're talking about physical assets worth hundreds of millions of dollars that are transporting um, you know, four, trillions of, four trillion dollars worth of goods a year. And it's the reason why we have all of this. And, and when it comes to insuring that, you, I mean, I can imagine being an insuring co insurance company and saying, <laughs> you know what, I actually do want to know where you are. Do you say you are where you said you were going to be? <laughs> um, and especially when it comes to tracking illegal activity, this is also really important. So I see your point, but I also think there are significant benefits that I do outweigh, in that AIS in particular, I think. Um, I think it's a balance, right? And yeah, yeah, you gotta exactly. you got to find the, right. the, the line. So, yeah. Sorry. So, so AIS, just to clarify, because I'm not quite sure I know what it is, that's the automatic identification system. It's right. not that old, but it's still a few years old. But it only tracks speed, contact information. It, it doesn't track much, right, compared to what you guys are all thinking about. So um, AIS um, carries the name of the vessel. Which can be faked, I've read. Um, we can talk about it in a second, right? But in a, if, in a, from, a, from, a, from a good actor, okay. right, it, uh, it carries the name of the vessel. It carries its GPS location, yeah. its speed, its direction, its heading, its type of the vessel, mm -hmm. which gives you a hint of the, tar of the cargo. It's, uh, it's origin and destination, okay. right? Um, uh, it is a reasonable am uh, amount of information for you to know, for example, um, where oil is on the planet, right? Some of our customers are hedge funds that uh, uh, trade the price of oil, and they mm -hmm. use that information to predict that, right? Um, uh, it does not give you any information of the actual cargo, like the containers that are on the ship. And it does not give you any of the information that um, uh, I think uh, Anthony is talking about, which is performance of the engine, um, uh, uh, environment on the ship, you know, um, sea wave, and, and, and other kind of stuff. Also, it doesn't uh, um, prevent a malefactor from turning AIS off. So the first thing a hijacker on a ship would yeah. probably do is turn it off, or if there were some other, you know, nefarious purpose. So it, it depends on opt-in cooperation to be successful as a system, which for the most part is, is in fact the case. So you can basically just flip a switch and turn it off? From a security switch. point of view, there's plenty of ways of, uh, of, of defeating it because you can just turn off the, the system. Even, even more so. I mean, we were, uh, you know, and all this, we were looking to recreate an AIS network of our own. So we looked into the process of, of registering an AIS device, right? It's, it's, you have to apply, you have to have an entity, mm -hmm. you apply, there's no due diligence. You could, I could have said whatever, uh, and I get a number that I plug into a radio transceiver that I bought on Amazon for $300, and that's it. <laughs> um, there's no, it. There was no background check. There was no, I mean, this is a really rudimentary process. Um, so it's, it's, fa it's fascinating. Do you have any other questions? No. OK. Um, Talk to me a little bit about UUAVs. About what? Sorry? UUAVs. U UUVs. UUVs. Yeah. So, uh, UUVs. Thank well, uh, I think the uh, under the surface of the ocean space is uh, likely to become quite crowded. I mean, there are plenty of uh, players already in the space who are building essentially robotic 
miniature submarines that can take off from a sea base and go out to sea and come back. Boeing, you know, is yeah. one of many that are doing that. So this whole question also of autonomy in relation to systems that provide security uh, is going to be a big policy question for the commons as well, much as it is for drones. I mean, once you, you have our, the first aerial drone UAV swarm on swarm battle, right? Uh, that's going to give regulators things to think about for years. And I think that um, uh, the ocean, which has been relatively quiet below the surface, uh, because, again, because of the value of all the assets under the ocean, right. uh, is, is going to be, uh, over the next decade or so, swarming with autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles. Do you have an estimate of how many um, under the surface vehicles we have. On top of the surface, we have about 150 large well, ships. Un under the surface, it's primarily uh, manned uh, submarines. And currently. that's how many, well, roughly? It's cl that's supposedly classified. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know. Come on, John. We <laughs> <laughs> good try, good try. But, um, that's, that's also what makes the undersea environment, from a security point of view, so challenging. Because, um, you know, if you have the need to detect submarines. The only response right now is to send out another submarine because there's a point anomaly. So it's a $2 billion vehicle with 100 people on it, lots of risk, going out to do one specific thing to find out information when, in fact, you could probably do it with $5 million worth of robotic sensors. So but how, you know, how is it powered? So it's a battery? Well, so, so there's does different... that become an issue? Well, That's okay, right. so, so in terms of the surface vehicles that are robotic, there are different propulsion mechanisms. There's wave motion uh, uh, platforms where simply having it be on the ocean and go up and down and back and forth in the waves pushes it forward by a couple of knots at a time. And so, you know, if you're not in a hurry, you can dispatch it from the west coast of the United States and it'll arrive in Asia sooner or later, right? There's also sail drone, which is a different <laughs> paradigm where they have yeah. literally a sail and it, the wind pushes it along at two to three knots. Not so great if you don't want to be observed, but definitely, you know, an alternative. For the undersea, you know, kind of submarine equivalents, there's its battery technology, yep. which currently is a challenge, you know, much as it is in uh, vehicles, right. uh, hybrids and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the technology is getting uh, better and, and better. So, and you guys work on that as well. Yeah, I think it's, uh, there's three major challenges right now for the undersea. It's the battery life, can, can you get them long enough, which there's breakthroughs coming, right? There's communications, undersea communications, waves do some interesting things to the communication, so can you get a better communications network? And then the GPS that we had talked about before is how do you navigate under the sea? Do, is there an environmental issue here if we start to have more and more vehicles under the sea in, as well as all the stuff that's on that's on the surface we, we don't seem to care very much about the surface uh i mean so but are they because they're more they're more modern they're newer are they cleaner are they more efficient well, they're tending to they... be more battery powered right so it's a question of if you lose it and a battery sitting on the bottom of the ocean might affect the environment but as long as it's out there it's, it's not that much pollution. I mean, it's itself. probably fairly inconsequential the amount of oil we accidentally drop into the ocean every year. Um, and you could argue there are potential benefits from increasing the efficiency of monitoring the condition of the oceans uh, from an environmental yeah. perspective. I mean, we have this huge problem with plas the plastic ocean, for instance. Right. We, you know, could imagine a situation where chemical sensors, environmental sensors, uh, uh, biological sensors can actually help us manage the condition of the oceans in a way that, you know, m might offset the loss of one or two vehicles now and then that kind of rust out at the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. can, we, can we talk a little bit about why? Uh, so to give you a, a, a little background, ships have a VDR on board. Uh, it collects all the that's like the black box on a plane. How is it that ships and planes can fall into the ocean and we still can't find, can't find them? That is incredible to me. I mean, it's very simple. It's, I mean, like the, the only way to cover information about the location is through a constellation of satellites. Yep. And literally until the, uh, the emergence of, uh, um, uh, in this particular case, uh, Spire, it was just not economical to have a yep. constellation deployed at that size. Yes. Um, uh, very simple like that. The only way you can cover this data is you need lots of satellites and that would have cost lots of billions of dollars and that was just not economical yep. until now. So um, I think a couple of people have referenced illegal um, 
fishery, right? So that's about 20 billion losses a year. Can you talk a little bit about how what you guys are doing helps with that? I know you're working with some governments on it. Um, I think I read recently that there's a, Google's getting into this, Google Sea Watch or something. Yeah, yeah. So we have, we have, we have um, I'm not sure I'm going to talk about this. Um, what, we, what we have done is we have uh, 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 worked with, uh, with the Southeast Asian government, Indonesia mm -hmm. in particular. Uh, which has been very, very aggressive in, uh, in, in reining in illegal fishing. Um, I personally was shocked to learn that it's a $20 billion uh, uh, annual cost. What has been more shocking for someone that loves fish in every shape or form, from scuba diving to the end of my pole to on my plate, um, it is threatening the protein supply of about 3 billion people on this planet. That's true. Right? Um, and uh, again, coming back to, um, uh, uh, to answer this point, the only reason why this is happening is because, you know, if you, you, know, uh, if you can't see it, you know, there's nothing you can do about it, right? Um, uh, so it is a, a really, really large problem with data, I think, from all of us integrated and made available um, uh, is, is making it much, much harder to do that kind of theft. Yeah, I mean, this is a problem that we know about. Right. Any questions? Got a couple more minutes? No, oh, good. So w one of the previous um, speakers mentioned something about um, sort of We've spent a lot of time talking about tech in search of a problem, but it really seems like there's a huge problem out here that tech can really actually seriously help with. Um, so I want each, of, each one of you just to kind of talk specifically about what you're doing and how it helps. We provide data where the only way to get it is from space. Right. Um, that's, I think, uh, how we approach the problem from day one, is what is the natural habitat for a large number of satellites? There is no other technology to gather data about this, um, and I think that's where we're helping. And without it, we basically can't see anything except once every six to eight hours. Yep, that is correct. <laughs> so it, extremely low-cost, efficient sensor networks that can provide a picket line around fisheries, uh, off, uh, undersea infrastructure, cables, harbors, and also uh, carry out national security purposes. So I think we all heard Tony speak yesterday, 80% of the government's funding is going towards keeping the lights on. So the government's finally realizing that they can't build technology quick enough. So what we do is we help bring the Silicon Valley and the other tech companies into the government and provide that data to them. Uh, and, and we're bringing uh, the ability of the cloud to help drastically reduce the operating costs of uh, these shipping vessels when their industry has never been at a lower point. Um, they are struggling more than ever, and they need solutions to operate. We need these people, right? It is our livelihood. Uh, and so uh, we're helping them save the money that they need to, to hopefully get through this little recession right now that, that we're in <laughs> on the shipping world. Um, who knows how that will Great. continue. Well, well, thank you guys very much for this. It's taken me two years to put this panel together. <laughs> thank you.